Decision for Life. Welcome to First Baptist Church Indian Trail. Stand with me, if you will, and let's begin reading uh, with verse number one, and we'll read down to part of verse number five. Let's just read it out loud. I started saying sing it out loud, but uh, I've heard some of you. Um, let's, uh, let's begin in verse number one. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff they comfort me. And then in beginning in verse number five, we will uh, read part of it, but not all of it, okay? Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Here we go. Thou anointest my head with oil. That's our text this morning, that one little phrase. You say, preacher, how in the world something like that written so many hundreds of years ago could possibly have any relevance for the, me and the 21st century. Well, I'm glad you are thinking in those terms because uh, the pure definition is going to help you greatly today as you walk with God. Let's pray together. Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit would move among us and great power and wonder today. I pray that you would clear up in the hearts and minds of your people the reason why they're exhausted serving you. Would you enlighten them to the truth of the difference that you can make, living your life in us. In Jesus' name I pray and for his sake and all God's people said amen. Thank you so very much. Be seated, if you will. I want to give you a, just a little idea of uh, the anointing of the Spirit of God. It's, uh, it, it's really not that complicated, but at the same time, you come away scratching your head sometimes, wondering, why in the world can I do that? Um, suppose your neighbor were to come over to your house uh, with a little bit of oil and... Uh, Say, I am going to anoint you as king of America. Now I want to ask you a question. Would that change your life? Wouldn't change mine, but it might change yours, but I don't think so. Why? Because your neighbor doesn't have the authority to anoint you to make you king. So the definition that we're going to be working with today, pretty easy, it's the God-given ability to carry out and fulfill that which God has called you to do. It's the intellect, it is the talent, it is the authority, it's the stamina that you don't possess in your flesh that apart from God you would never be able to do. But with the anointing, Fulfill everything that God wants you to do in your life. Thou anointest my head with oil. What does it mean then to live an anointed life? Now, let me help you with something because pretty simple. You got to get back to the very basics of life, the very basics of our existence to understand, first of all, that you're not here accidentally. You are made by God and for God. And until you get hold of that, until that becomes a part of your really spiritual DNA, life is never going to be very fulfilling for you. Now, let me say that one more time, maybe a little bit differently. Until you understand that God birthed you with a plan and with a purpose that he wants to fulfill in you and through you in your life, life is really going to be very frustrating for you. 
Um, you are born by God with a plan. Um, I like to use the term, uh, God has a calling on every one of our lives. Now the word calling is really the Greek word kaleo. And it means to call out. May I ask you a question? Are you aware that God has a call on your life in particular for something that you're to do with your life? Are you aware of that? Everybody in this room, everybody in this building. Now, some of you, you may be called to be a taxi cab driver. Some of you may be called to be a banker. Some of you may be called to be a teacher. Some of you may be called to be a nurse. Some of you may be called to be a plumber. Some of you may be called to be a real estate agent. But without a doubt, God has a kaleo on your life. Now the fact of the matter is, and I've watched this really uh, all my life, I've watched it all my Christian life. Um, when I was a, a little bitty boy, probably no more than about that high, I'm just saying to you, the earliest memory that I have in my life was a religious fanatical aunt of mine. Her name was Bertha. Uh, you know, I've told you what a fanatic is, that somebody loves Jesus more than you do, but um, she, she was just that way. That's what we call her. We made fun of her. Laughed at her as my daddy's sister. And the earliest memories that I have in my life is my Aunt Bertha patting me on the head and she would say, Mikey, now don't you call me that. <laughs> Mikey, God's got something really special for your life. I remember that as vivid uh, as if it had occurred yesterday. Now, the problem with a lot of people is in this calling of God on their life, many miss out on it because they decide for themselves what direction that they're going to go in their own way and in their own life, and they miss God's plan, they miss God's call, and they have it uh, their way. And it's becoming very frustrating. They wind up unhappy. They never get really fulfilled in their life. Now, here's what I found to be true in most churches. Most churches, most people... Uh, who are part of a local body of believers feel like that the calling is just for missionaries. The calling is just for preachers. The calling is just for people in church work, if you will. And, and that's all that they ever see this calling of God. But the fact of the matter is, God might call you as a businessman. God might call you into sales. God may call you to be a politician. I don't know. But I will say you do, to this, if you don't hear anything else, hear this. Whatever God calls you to do, God will enable you to do it. No matter what that might be. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10, the Bible says, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus. Here's the purpose, here's the plan, to do good works. Which God, listen to this, prepared in advance. It's not haphazard. It's not accidental. It's not fly by the seat of your pants kind of approach. God says, which God has prepared in advance for us to do. He, he has determined what call is on your life. Now, let me go a step further. You're not going to be able to carry out that call of God on your life without the supernatural intervention of God in you and through you. Now, I'm, I'm going to spend just a few minutes this morning. I want to give you five or six things that I have learned personally uh, about the anointing of God. Are you all ready for it? Shake your head like that. I can't half see you because of the lights in here that you're going to help me pay for to get fixed somewhere down the way. <laughs> Five or six things that uh, God's taught me about the anointing, and some of them are overlapped and intertwined, but I, I think you'll get the message. 
First of all, he equips me when he enlists me. He equips me when he enlists me. Ephesians, excuse me, 1 Thessalonians 5, the Bible says, faithful is he who calls you who will also do it. You understand, when you get saved, when you trust Jesus Christ, when you turn away from sin and place your faith and your trust in him, the Holy Spirit of God takes up residence within you and equips you so that you allow him to live through your life to accomplish whatever it is that God has called you to do. He puts his spirit in you and you can count on his anointing to accomplish what God's called you to do. Um, great example, if you go back to the book of Acts, when the Holy Spirit of God said to these disciples, uh, he says, uh, hey men, the last thing I want to tell you, this is Jesus before he ascended back into heaven. By the way, if, if you ever really uh, want something interesting uh, study the last words of somebody. And uh, the last words of Jesus before he ascended back to heaven was not, I'll see you in the rapture. But he says to these disciples, you shall be witnesses unto me. And turn this world upside down, all over the world. Now, what an interesting thing to give it to, to these disciples, these apostles that he's left behind such a difficult, impossible assignment. You want me to reach the world? Well, we don't have internet. Uh, we don't have airplanes. We don't have anything right now that uh, can do mass mailing. We, we have, no, But yet, God says to them, I'm going to accomplish this through you. I, I want you to do this. How? He says, after that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you you'll be witnesses unto me. I, I will provide for you the power, the ability, the talent, the wherewithal to accomplish what I have called you and assigned you. They couldn't have possibly done it on their own. They needed God. So God says to them, I will make the impossible possible in you and through you. I will equip you. I, I'll tell you, uh, I may refer back to this somewhere in the message in a few minutes, but uh, I'll never forget um, my call. Uh, the call of God on my life has gotten me through more than you could ever imagine. I, I'll never forget being at Sears working in the carpet department in 1971. And the Holy Spirit of God says, and here, here was the progression. He started out saying, you're doing a good job. And I knew it was him. And then a little while later, it went from you're doing a good job to you're doing a good job, but I've got something else for you. And then it went to you're doing a good job. I got something else for you. I want you to preach the gospel. Now, there was this period of time, maybe six months to a year that goes by from when that call came until I was leading the music in a revival meeting in a November um, somewhere around uh, 1973 and uh, I was standing there with that hymnal and, and the overwhelming call of God came on my life and I said, I'll do it, but I just want to make sure. God answered the prayer that I prayed in a matter of seconds, right before my very eyes. I just closed up the hymnal, went to my pastor, told him God had called me to preach uh, they get my wife, bring my wife down there. I had never, this is terrible. I was not a good husband back in those days. And I never even communicated for those two year period of time that God was calling me into the ministry. And, and, and I'll never forget, as long as I live, the first words out of her mouth was, how are we going to make it? How are we going to do that? I'm just telling you, friend, God equips you when he enlists you, you will make it. Let me give you number two. He enlightens me. He enlightens me. Uh, go study, I won't, won't do it today, but go study 1 Samuel 10. And Samuel has uh, 
anointed Saul to be king over Israel. And Saul had lots of doubts uh, about uh, being able to do it and that God was really in it. And Samuel said, Saul, let me just tell you, God's going to do this and this and this and this. And, and, and you're going to know that it's him. But then he gets down into verse number 6 of 1 Samuel 10. And he makes this statement. You will be changed into a different person. You'll be transformed. You'll be made over. You'll be different. God's Holy Spirit's anointing. You'll be a different person carrying out what God has inevitably called you to do. May, may I say to you, when you answer the call of God on your life and God anoints you for the task that he has called you, it will change you, it will transform you. When God is working in you and through you to perform what it is that he's called you to do, you're gonna be more confident, you're gonna be more competent, uh, you're gonna be more in tune when you are doing what you are supposed to be doing in your life. Let me give you number three. He energizes me. He energizes me. Now, guys, listen. There is a huge difference in living life in your own strength and allowing the Spirit of God to live his life in you. There's an amazing difference. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16, the Bible says, I pray that out of his glorious riches... He may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. Now, I'm an old mountain boy. I, I grew up over in western North Carolina. My daddy was a drunk and a card-carrying certified moonshine bootlegger. And I know where I came from. I know the humble beginnings. I, I'm not the most talented guy. I'm not the most gifted guy. I'm very limited in wisdom and in knowledge, but here's the deal, God's not limited at all. God's not limited in any shape, form, or fashion. And the anointing of God brings his strength into you that you never dreamed that you would ever be able to do. Um, Here's the reason that so many of you get burned out trying to serve the Lord. It's because you're doing it in your own strength rather than letting God live his life in you to empower you with his supernatural power to accomplish what only he can do through you. He calls you. He sets you apart. He sets you up and gives you a job that you were born to accomplish, and then, if that's not enough, then he lives it out in you and through you. Philippians 4 says this, one of the most quoted verses of Scripture, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, I'm just saying to you, and, I, and A's Wicker is here and pastored one of the greatest churches uh, in America, and the Southern Baptist Convention down in Florida has preached here before. I hope to preach here again one of these days. And he's going to understand. Ken's going to understand. Uh, Rod's going to understand. All you preachers that are here are going to understand because I'm just now describing to you the miracle of preaching. Uh, that is my context. Uh, that's what I can speak uh, from. Um, I was talking to, a, uh, talking to my medical doctor I used to suffer greatly with migraine headaches. Matter of fact, uh, God delivered me since I've been here at First Baptist. And I suffered horribly with migraines. Put me in the hospital. I mean, it just really incapacitated me. And I can't tell you the numbers of times, and Brother Sammy will testify to this, I can't tell you the numbers of times that I have left that seat right over there suffering as bad as you could suffer with a migraine headache and get up here behind this sacred desk and the pain and the nausea would completely leave me and I would preach under the anointing of the Spirit of God, give the invitation, walk down off of the platform. 
I was explaining all that to my doctor, and here's what he said. He said, oh, it's just adrenaline. Can I say to you, adrenaline gives out. Uh, It doesn't last very long. But the supernatural power of God is limitless. Now I want you to fill in the blanks for me. I can do all things through and then fill in the blank. I can do all things, maybe some of you said, well, if I get medicated enough or if I have the right team around me that we can work together or I can do all things if I have a big enough bank account. All of that stuff is like adrenaline and it's gonna dry up. And by the way, let me just say this before I go any further. If you're expecting somebody else to meet the needs of your life, you're gonna live frustrated from now on. Because people are not going to meet the physical needs of your life. They're not going to meet the emotional needs of your life. They're not going to meet the spiritual needs uh, of your life. And you're going to wind up disappointed if you're, hey, husbands, if you're looking for your wife to meet all those needs in your life, you're going to be disappointed. Wives, if you're looking for your husbands to meet those needs in your life, you're going to wind up being extremely disappointed. Nobody can do that. Only God can meet those needs in your life. And so you look to him and he says, I will give you my anointing. But by the way, do you know what the definition of Christ is? What, what the Greek definition of Christ is? It's the anointed one. So when we're talking about Thou anointest my head with oil. What God is saying, I'm going to give you my son. I'm going to give you Jesus. So if you're really, if you're receiving the anointing of God, you're really receiving Jesus. By the way, uh, do do you know what the Hebrew definition of the term Messiah is? The anointed one. So when we're talking about anointing here. What we're really talking about is Jesus. Number four, he enables me. He enables me. You see, the Lord does in you what you can't do for yourselves. Uh, How many of you are facing right now some insurmountable problems you, you may, and you're not going to get out of this life without at some point in time facing some insurmountable problems in your job, in your marriage, in your finances. It's going to happen. Mark it down. What do you depend on when you get your back up against the wall? What do you depend on when you have an insurmountable obstacle in your pathway? If you're going to get there and you will, Ladies and gentlemen, you must have the anointing of God on your life. Luke chapter 18, verse 27, the Bible says uh, what is impossible with us is possible with God. The Bible says in Ephesians 3, 20, now to him who is uh, able to do immeasurably more, more than what? More than you could ever ask and more than you can even imagine. Now listen to this. According to the power which he works in us. So God comes along, he says, hey Mike, ask me for anything. Just ask me for anything. Uh, anything that is beyond your own imagination. Uh, drill down, ask me to do the greatest thing that you could ever think of for me to do in your life. Something that you may be afraid to ask or timid to ask, just ask me for it. Uh, anything that you can imagine. And God says, when you do, I'm just going to tell you, I can beat that. I I can beat that. I can give bigger and better even what you're asking for. So when you read now to him that is 
able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine according to the power that is at work within us. What God is saying is that my anointing can do more for you, in you, and through you than you could even conjure up in your wildest imaginations. By the way, that's not just true for me, it's true for you as well. God can do infinitely more in you than you can imagine. More for your family, more for your business, more for your career, anything. You, you understand that God enables me um, to accomplish the possible when it seems to be impossible. Let me give you number five. I probably like this one as good or better than any that I put down here. He encourages me to encourage others. He anoints me to bless other people. Um, I, I don't know what God's called you to do and how he's blessed you in your life, but I will tell you this, uh, he didn't bless just for you. He blessed you for the benefit of somebody else to be able to extend to them what God has given to you and bestowed on you. And in the process of you blessing others with what God has blessed you with, what happens? I just get even more blessed. And that's true with the anointing. When I become a channel of the power of God to touch your life and to touch yours and to touch somebody else's, you know, that's a two-way channel. It just comes back and blesses me so that I can even bless more. Let, let, let me give you a passage of scripture. I've really been wrapped up in Isaiah in my personal private time uh, all week this week. And uh, Isaiah chapter 61 is a powerful, powerful uh, word from God. And there are six things recorded here in the scripture um, that God does through his anointing. Let, let me read it to you. In Isaiah 61, and guys, if you could, good, they got it up there. I was hoping they would. So here we go. In Isaiah 61, the Bible says, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. All right, there's, there's the first thing. I, for, for those that are down and out, uh, I am to bear good news. For those that are discouraged, I am to bear the good news. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. To, to those that are just crushed in their spirit, for those that are depressed, uh, for those that ha have seemingly lost everything, their hearts are crushed. Then he says, to proclaim freedom for the captives, to those that uh, are in addictions, bound up by some habit, and released from darkness, those that have been blinded. The, the Bible says the God of this world has blinded the minds of people that they cannot believe, and so they have been imprisoned. And God says, I, I want to send you uh, to encourage those people to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. Boy, here's one. And every one of you, I promise you, before you get out of this life, uh, he says to comfort all who mourn. Um, wow, has God given me the ability in these last few days to be able to do that. Um, I never, and, and by the way, <laughs> uh, I've received a whole lot more than I've given out, I'm afraid, during these last few days. But uh, I was 71 years old. I, I don't know that I want to admit this, but I was 71 years old before I ever experienced grief. Before I've ever mourned in my life. And just yesterday, I opened up a card out of the mailbox. And somebody under the anointing of the Holy Spirit of God did exactly what the scriptures are teaching. Let me go on. I could, I could preach there for a while. And provide for those who grieve in Zion to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes. God says, I'm going to give you this anointing so that you can help other people that are in pain. It's not just for you. It's for you to be channeled through to give to others. The blessings, of, but hey, here's a good little fact. This is the text 
of the first sermon that Jesus ever preached publicly. And he says, uh, I am him. This is who the scripture is talking about. It's me. He sent me here to do this. Well, that's another sermon. You understand, when you get anointed, that's what you're going to do. You're going to go around making the world a better place. You're going to go around allowing God to heal other people through you that are in pain. Let me give you the last one. And I had a hard time just coming up with an E word for this one. But uh, right before I went to bed last night, I was going over my notes. The last thing I do before I go to sleep is I put that, those notes and stuff in my mind so I can remember. And, and it, 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 it kind of changed the word for me. And I'm using the word exhausting. Exhausting. You say, why, why did you use the word exhausting? It's because of the song that we sang a few minutes ago. That, that fresh, I need a fresh anointing because what I got yesterday is not good enough for today. And, and if, you, if you hang around people long enough, you get to listening to their testimonies. And, and you know, a lot of people have a testimony that is decades old. Oh, pastor, I'm going to tell you, um, I got a quiver in my liver at student camp in 1976. I got a buddy of mine, really. I, I love him with all my heart. But the most up-to-date testimony he's got is about 40 years old. Can, can I say to you, the anointing that God gave you yesterday is not going to be sufficient for the needs of today. That, that's why when God called the children of Israel out and, and he fed them manna every day, manna would fall and they would have to go out and pick up the manna that day for that day's needs because the next day that manna would be rotten and it wouldn't be good enough for what their needs would be for that day. That's why he said, give us this day our monthly bread. Give us this day our daily bread. God wants you to depend on him every day of your life. And you're going to need, my time's gone. You're going to need a fresh anointing tomorrow. And the day after that, and the day after that, and the day after that. How many of us, Hayes, have we seen in mine and your ministry that God used so greatly mightily the anointing of God was on them and they were bearing fruit through their life and nowadays you look and you're scratching your head and you're wondering what happened to them look around you church look in some of these empty seats that are around you for they were once occupied by a man of God or a woman of God that God had his hand on and they were being used and bearing fruit in incredible ways but they're no longer here anymore Matter of fact, they're not in church anymore. They're not being used anymore. They're not bearing fruit anymore. Why is that? Because we're like a party balloon that gets filled up with helium and then after a little while, that stuff begins to leak out. Hosea chapter 10 Verse 12, the Bible says, Sow righteousness for yourselves. Reap the fruit of unfailing love and break up your, uh, the old King James used, fallowed ground. Break up your unplowed ground for it's time to seek the Lord until he comes and showers you with his righteousness. Some of you are here this morning, your heart has grown so hard and dry and crusty and cold and it's like a field out there that has not been plowed up and it's not able to bear fruit and to sprout new growth. It's because it's so hard and crusty and God says, oh, I want to pour my righteousness out on you. I want to give you a fresh anointing, but your heart is so hard, it's so cold. You have unforgiveness in your heart towards somebody else. 
You've developed a spirit of pride or a spirit of greed that has hardened your heart. God says, till up that old ground that is in there. And you're never going to bear any fruit until that soil gets up. I don't want to say this, but I, I didn't want to say it when I wrote it in my notes, but I'm going to say it anyway. God sometimes has to send storms into our life to soften up our hearts. And could it be that some of you are going through a storm right now because God wants to do so much in you that he's not doing it? Here's a thought. Here's a thought. We would really be extremely sad if God somehow cinematically showed us everything that could have been ours if we had just lived our life under his anointing to see where we would have been had we made the right choices and let him live his life in us. I'm going to tell you what will blow your mind. If God somehow were to show you this morning what your life could be like from today going forward, if you would come to the place in your life that you would get tired of living life in your own strength, in your own energy, in your own ingenuity, in your own talent, and come to the place that you would just say, God, I'm tired of living life like that. I want you to live your life in me and through me so that I could enjoy the fulfillment that I know that you have for me while living in your calling on my life. How many of you could honestly and genuinely and sincerely say, Pastor, I know today that I have surrendered to the calling that God has on my life and I'm doing what he has called me to do and I'm loving every minute of it. How many of you bothered to find out what God's call is on your life? Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fpcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.